Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, February 16th. I'm Teresa Collier in for Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the Department of Labor is meeting with immigrant workers from the state's poultry industry to discuss possible workers' rights violations. Then, as the New Orleans Catholic Diocese bankruptcy case drags into its fourth year, hundreds of survivors are waiting for justice. Plus, officials at the Mississippi University for Women are asking lawmakers to approve a name change. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The U.S. Department of Labor is visiting with workers and organizers across Mississippi this week. One of those meetings is with dozens of immigrant poultry workers, a working group that was targeted by ICE raids in 2019. During that raid, 680 workers were arrested for immigration violations. And in July of last year, a 16-year-old was cleaning a deboning machine at a poultry plant in Hattiesburg when he was pulled in and killed by the machine. That company was found to be at fault by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in January and fined $200,000. Lorena Kiros is the executive director for the Immigrant Alliance for Justice and Equity. She tells our Mike McEwen there must be more safeguards in place for immigrant workers in Mississippi because they are often exploited by employers. I'm an immigrant myself. In Mississippi, I'm not sure we understand the word immigrant, right? I think a lot of the times people are not re- don't realize the A, B, C, D, E, F, G of immigration, the nuanced. Uh, there's a lot of us that you know come here with visas, uh, tourist visas, work visas, residence, and then citizenship. I think that's why the work is so difficult here in Mississippi because there's no understanding of the word itself. So it's important when we have visitors from D.C., national visitors come and talk to community members and make it clear that they also are protected, that they're worried about their humanities and that deserve, they deserve to work in dignity. Um, so we were more than thrilled to hear that the secretary was going to come right here in our humble in our humble community center, right? We're meeting in a warehouse in the middle of Jackson, of West Jackson. Um, and we have people that drove all the way from Hattiesburg, from Carthage, from Canton. And they even got to speak to her, something that they didn't realize that they were going to have the opportunity. So hopefully this will bring um, awareness of these protections, these deferred actions that we fought so hard for. You were speaking about some of the nuances and understanding immigration and migrant communities in Mississippi. To my understanding, part of what led to Duvon Perez's situation at Marjack was not only that he was a migrant from Latin America, but within that he was also indigenous, from an indigenous community in his home country. How does one's status as both a migrant and an indigenous migrant in the poultry industry here, how does that make things worse for them, or does it? First of all, we often erase indigeneity here in, in, in the nation and in Mississippi. When we responded to the raids, we heard a lot about Latinx workers, and that wasn't so. The majority of the people were indigenous. Spanish was a second language. We didn't have interpreters. We didn't have people that were culturally competent. So, of course, in the case of young Duvan, um, the idea that this indigenous person who ancestry, right, goes back thousands of years. We have Mayan indigenous people that feel safe in the beautiful landscape of Mississippi, Um, oftentimes they're even marginalized by our own people. So Latinx people, people of color, we do have colorism. We do have the erasure erasure of the indigeneity. Um, Oftentimes white supremacy does affect us, and we we think that the, the whiter we are, the better. And so there's even that seclusion between our own Latinx Hispanic community. And so not being able to communicate effectively in Spanish, um, I assume we've heard many stories of people that wear their indigenous, um, their outfits, their clothes. Um, That's denied from them. So young children are kind of bullied into having to leave their culture and speaking Spanish. And one thing that we heard on the radio when the young man was killed, we heard in conservative radios that they said, well, this is this is their fault. This is their fault because they crossed the border. 
And we know, especially indigenous people of Central America, they're fleeing climate changes. They're not able to produce food. So they're coming to, to Mississippi, fertile, right? The fertile land of Mississippi to come and be able to survive and feed their families. So understanding the narrative of why we're here so that we can feed our people, right? So that we can make sure that our families are able to have a dignified life. And then seeing this child handed to his mom in pieces, that is just, you know, why isn't there a huge outcry nationally about what has happened to this child right here. What do you think it'll mean for the Latino community in Mississippi that after the death of Duvon Perez and other abuses in the immigration raids, that someone from the Federal Department of Labor has come here to hear them out and to give them a platform to speak? So we have about 30 WhatsApps with different towns all over Mississippi. And I know for a fact that people are feeling heard. The fact that they are, that we're having a meeting in Spanish. And that's one thing that we were intentional, right? We, we, we brought interpreting pieces so that we can interpret to English. So it means a lot. And hopefully like in the conversation, and one of the speakers said this won't just be a, a document and, and a checking off, or when I went to Mississippi, let's check it off. But it'll be a, a continued collaboration with, between people you know, in these higher up positions in the federal government to come here and listen to us so that we can feel protected. Lorena Quiroz leads the Immigrant Alliance for Justice and Equity. Among the government officials meeting with the workers to discuss these concerns is Department of Labor Acting Secretary Julie Sue. She says the workers she has met with are detailing a wide range of abuse within the poultry industry, including how immigration status is being used against them. Well, I'm here in Mississippi today to meet with workers mainly, um, to hear from them, to understand uh, what the struggles and the challenges, but also the opportunities that they are uh, feeling in uh, in President Biden's America, uh, where we're creating uh, jobs uh, at you know at a historic pace, where the investments in uh, infrastructure and clean water are making a real difference, but also where too many workers still work under conditions that are uh, dangerous and poor where their immigration status is weaponized against them and where they um, they don't feel seen and heard. I wanted to make sure that they knew that, uh, that we do see and hear them. The investments in America, President Biden's agenda to really, uh, you know, rebuild our infrastructure, create manufacturing and, and have an actual industrial strategy is about building the high road to the middle class. But we can't build that high road if we don't also combat the low road. If we let uh, rampant violations continue or if we allow employers who've decided that it's cheaper to break the law and the chance of getting caught are slim to keep on continuing those practices. And part of the Department of Labor's job is to enforce basic labor laws to make sure that every worker gets a just day's pay for a hard day's work, that every worker goes home healthy and safe at the end of the day. We know that is not happening the way it needs to, and so I'm here to, with my team, to reinforce the message that we are here uh, to do our jobs and we rely on workers feeling trust and coming forward in order to do that. So we have to not just penalize employers who look the other way uh, when you know when when there are such significant workplace hazards we also have to do better to prevent those violations from happening in the first place so we're here at an immigration advocacy organization what did workers tell you what did they describe to you in their experience working in the poultry industry in Mississippi well, I mean, these are very, very difficult jobs, and uh, they're jobs where too often uh, workers do not bring home the pay that they're supposed to be paid. Um, they, uh, you know, are, are fearful of, uh, you know, whether they're going to get injured on the job, uh, lose a finger, and even, uh, uh, you know, die. Um, and they are also feeling very much like their immigration status gets weaponized against them, and uh, that builds uh, deep fear about coming forward and uh, we know that we have to create an environment where workers, where workers can come forward to report what's happening in order for us to put a stop to these abuses. So immigration is a very hot topic, political topic in the, in the country right now, especially in Congress. What are some ways or how challenging is it to advocate for immigrant workers in these situations with that prevailing culture in mind? 
So workers' rights uh, apply to all workers, regardless of immigration status, and that's a really important message. Uh, it makes sense uh, because it's a matter of basic humanity, uh, but it also makes sense because if we carve out whole groups of workers to not enjoy the protections of our laws, then we create an entire vulnerable workforce that is you know, bad for communities, uh, bad for families, and also bad for our economy. And so um, it's really important to repeat that all workers, uh, regardless of status, enjoy the protections of our labor laws. Julie Sue is acting secretary of the U.S. Department of Labor. Coming up, as the New Orleans Catholic Archdiocese bankruptcy case drags into its fourth year, hundreds of survivors are waiting for justice. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. For moments in black history, we salute Ralph Boston. Born in Laurel, Mississippi in 1939 and passed away in April of 2023. Ralph Boston was an American track athlete who became the first person to break the 27 feet barrier in the long jump. He medaled in each of the Olympic Games he participated in, Rome, Tokyo, and Mexico City. Ralph Boston was inducted into the USA Track and Field Hall of Fame and the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Hall of Fame. This has been MPB's Moments in Black History. The Governor's Arts Awards, the Mississippi Arts Commission's annual recognition of the state's artistic and cultural heritage, will honor five creative Mississippians for their significant contributions to the arts. February 16th at 7.30 p.m. on MPB Television. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Teresa Collier in for Desiree Frazier. For nearly four years, the New Orleans Catholic Archdiocese has been in bankruptcy court. It's seeking protection from dozens of lawsuits after revelations that more than 300 church workers were reported for sexual abuse. The Guardian's Ramon Vargas has been reporting on these cases for years and tracking the tactics the Archdiocese is using to avoid responsibility. The Gulf States Newsroom's Drew Hawkins sat down with Vargas and a survivor of that abuse, Aaron Abair. And a warning for listeners, this story contains details of the sexual abuse of children. Ramon, you've been covering sexual abuse of children by members of the clergy for a long time now, and going back to your days back at the times Picayune. And you've had some really significant outcomes in the cases that you looked at. I'm thinking specifically right now about a recent one you've done with WWL's David Hammer. Um, can you maybe just talk a little bit about the impacts of your reporting? I think that the one that illustrates the strongest impact um, was Lauren Tucker, right? Um, we were able to, Lauren Tucker was a, uh, you know, just to set it up, Lauren Tucker was a, a priest who had been um, basically forced to retire in 2002 for um, molesting children that he met through his work. And so one of the things that we got an idea as he was reporting that story uh, on my story was um, to, like, knock on Lauren Tucker's door and see what he said. And mm. so Hammer went. I went with him. As well. I went with them as well. In here, it's not just allegations anymore. Here you're saying that you did this, that you had uh, simultaneous masturbation with uh, someone who was under 16, you say, about wrestling and touching. Evidently, yes. Do you remember these people that you describe here? You have... The names are redacted, but you say that there were overtly sexual acts with this person, uh, but that person was 100% willing, and he was 15 to 17 years old, lived in St. Francis of Assisi Parish. Yes. That sort of, you know, doorstop confession, really dramatic. It couldn't be ignored, and and, and their indictments came down less than a week or just over a week later, right? But there are so many other stories. What's next for your reporting? Are Are there more cases you're looking into in the region? What's so frustrating about this is that, like, it takes such a long time to prepare and to, like, move, you know, you, you move the, the needle, like, an inch, two inches, and it takes you weeks to do it. Um, did the culture of covering that stuff up, like, did it succeed to the point that n- everyone's going to get away with it? Or, like, is is can can there be, like, some consequences leveraged against people who knew and did nothing about it or who knew and um and actively worked against that person that were being held accountable and i think that that's like the question some some of the reporting is going to reflect like what happens with that aaron turning to you for a little bit 
you're a survivor who's been really vocal about what happened to you. Can you tell us a little bit about your own experience and what it's like to be vocal in a place like Louisiana? And just a quick note here for listeners, if you're just joining us, we're going to get into some of the details here of Aaron's experiences of being sexually abused as a child. First off, let me uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm here as a, number one, as a victim, survivor, and I'm also an advocate, a strong advocate for those who are abused by clergy members. And uh, I remember quite well what happened to me and the others that Father Hecker molested back in 1968 when I was an eighth grade student at St. Joseph in Gretna, Louisiana. I'll never forget Father Hecker on his knees looking up at me while he was groping me and groping my genitals. Father Hecker was a monster walking amongst us. My guilt that I carried and the cross that I carry is that all those years I didn't tell anybody anything is that he went on to other parishes and probably did other things to other children. Had I only only opened up my mouth and told somebody about it, maybe the authorities could have done something about it. Well, first of all, Aaron, thank you for sharing that with us. I know that wasn't easy. And you talk about feeling like a man on a mountain, yes. isolated, and how it was your own memory was repressed. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about how important it is to bring attention to these crimes, even if it's been decades in many cases? It, it has been. And, and, you know, there's with with me coming out and remembering the things that I remember, and especially the friends that told me what happened to them, it just created a sense of having to accomplish getting the word out letting the people know, letting the, whoever would listen to me, you know, uh, take care. Because this man was still living amongst us. He was still walking amongst us. He was, you know, doing everything. You know, even the archdiocese gave him a 60-year uh, anniversary big party to celebrate his 60th year as a priest. And my mantra or my mission is to get the word out to all the parishioners within the Catholic Church to see and open up their eyes to what's going on around them. I've kind of given up on the Catholic faith altogether, but, you know, I don't need an institution to tell me that the Lord above is my guard and savior, uh, and I don't need an institution to tell me that. That was the Gulf States Newsroom's Drew Hawkins talking with Aaron A. Bear and Guardian reporter Ramon Vargas about the sexual abuse scandal unfolding in the New Orleans Catholic Archdiocese. The Gulf States Newsroom is a partnership between Mississippi Public Broadcasting and public radio stations in Alabama and Louisiana. Coming up, officials at the Mississippi University for Women are asking lawmakers to approve a name change. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Richard Gershon, the host of In Legal Terms and a professor at the University of Mississippi School of Law. If you miss a live In Legal Terms episode, find our podcast, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Classical, jazz, indie, blues, folk, bluegrass, whatever you call your music. Find it on MPB Music Radio on mpbonline.org or the MPB Public Media app or on an HD radio. From children's education to gripping drama, documentaries to comedy, MPB Television brings the world to Mississippi. With local stories, cooking, health, and music, MPB Television takes Mississippi to the world. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Teresa Collier in for Desiree Frazier. Officials at the Mississippi University for Women, or the W, announced a new proposal for a name change this week. The new name, Winbridge State University of Mississippi. It's the second time a sec is the second name put forward by university leaders this year following an outpouring of comments against the name being changed to Brightwell University. Regardless of the name, it will always be the W. That's Keith Gaskin, mayor of the city of Columbus and a former educator at the W. He's echoing a point that everyone involved in the name change agrees on. 
No matter what the new name is, they still want to go by the W. Mayor Gaskin says changing the name can help the university maintain growth in the coming years, removing a barrier for students who want a more gender-inclusive education. This institution means so much to Columbus and the state of Mississippi. And it's just another reminder of when it's time to come together to work to move this university forward. I will be on the phone today calling Jackson, talking to folks about the importance of getting behind this university and the hard-working administration that has been here working their hearts out even if you didn't agree with everything, for the betterment of this institution and, in my mind, the betterment of Columbus, Mississippi, so they have my full, unwavering support, and I will work with them until they cross the finish line. The Mississippi University for Women was founded in 1884 and was the first women's college in the nation. Because of that history, many students and alumni were averse to a name change that did not include reference to the university's legacy. University President Nora Miller says that history is important, but it's also time to better represent what the school offers today. We have expanded into a co-educational university offering undergraduate and graduate degrees in professional and liberal arts programs while maintaining our historic mission to promote women's education and leadership. We have been challenged by a name that does not represent our diverse student body. The four women in our name creates confusion and creates an unnecessary barrier for men and women seeking a co-educational experience. We began the process of seeking a more inclusive name for our university over 18 months ago. This past month, our very passionate alumni and friends reminded us that our identity as the W has both an enduring legacy and the flexibility to carry our institution into the future. By enshrining our commitment to the W in the law, We promise our community that graduates, past, present, and future will remain united as W grads. The proposed legislation states that we will continue to be known as the W, but our new formal name will be Winbridge State University of Mississippi. Winbridge was a name submitted by alumni and faculty The first part of the name, Wynn, W-Y-N, is Old English for the letter W. And then the latter part, Bridge, connects the past to the future, connects our alumni to our students, and connects our campus to the community. I urge everyone who supports this name to contact your legislators and let them know you support legislation that allows us to remain as the W while having the formal name Winbridge State University of Mississippi. This has been Mississippi Edition.